How do you feel when you try to take part in a group? It's super common for those of us who grew up with abuse and neglect to feel as adults that we are somehow not quite part of things. Do you have this? Where you feel like you're on the outside of groups, kind of in it, kind of not in it, but never really part of it. Or you start as a full participant, but then you pull away over time. You uninclude yourself. I've done this so many times. Now maybe you're resigned to the fact that groups are just not for you, but belonging is important and it's a real need that all people have. So you might be still trying and trying, joining groups, getting uncomfortable or feeling excluded and then dropping out again. And maybe you think in each case that the problem is other people. And sometimes that could be true. But the telltale sign that this could be a personal choice, even when it doesn't feel like it, is that you're almost always at about the same distance from the center. And by that I mean every group has a center, a leader or two who are at the very middle, and then all around them are the people who put a lot of time and energy into the group. And a little further out are the people who are involved and influential, but not as much as the people near the center, and so on. Now in my case, I used to always like to settle at about 80% out from the center. Invited to the party, but not responsible for making the party happen. And a lot of times I'd, I'd start out motivated and thinking, you know what, this group is great. I'm, I finally found my people. I want to be involved with this. And then I'd move towards the very center of the group, maybe take on a more active role, maybe even a leadership role. And then sooner or later, probably sooner, I would find some reason to pull back. I might go to about 40% out of the circle first, but eventually I'd bounce out of the group altogether. So being part of something was, and, and in some areas of my life, it still is really uncomfortable for me. So why is that? I used to think my trouble with groups was just one episode of bad luck after another, the wrong coworkers, the wrong mom's group, the wrong 12-step friends. And I'd think, I guess I'm just really different. These people don't get me. And I never saw that it was a consistent pattern until I had a lot of healing from dysregulation and I started to have some clarity. And it makes sense because being in a group when you have the sensitivities of childhood PTSD can be too much. People are triggering, right? And groups of people, it's like a bunch of triggering people and the group dynamic that brings up all your pain about belonging and fitting in and all the times that that didn't happen. So dealing with a lot of people can be like an assault on your senses and it gets really emotional. It's like a high school experience that just never stops. <laughs> so childhood PTSD, it's not the same thing as introversion, but I suspect there are similarities in that being social with people can take more energy than it gives because you're just working so hard to act normal, to deal with it all, you know? But the thing is when we need people, we need them on a practical level and we need relationships if we're going to start healing the wounds of trauma, which are largely relational wounds. They affect your nervous system, but they were caused by what happened between you and other people, you know, namely your parents. So the healing needs to happen before you have social relationships, but also it needs to happen within social relationships. The little interactions is where you get to practice what you're learning and where you get nourished emotionally, even though sometimes there's pain involved. There's criticism and rejection and genuinely being different in a group where everyone else seems to feel connected. But all that can get easier. So like everyone else, you need a sense of belonging. So it's natural that you'd gravitate to groups, but toward the outer edges at first. It's a little more manageable. You can be around people and be social a little bit, but just keep one foot out the door in case you need to get the heck out of there. It's okay to do that, by the way. Healthy groups have roles and space for many kinds of people, and it's okay not to participate fully for a while. Life would be great if you could keep going like this, just soaking up the group belonging feeling, not risking your emotions by getting too involved. But the problem is that relationships that are all on the periphery of groups make it really hard to develop meaning in your life. You need some friction. You need some contact with people to develop social skills. Everyone needs this. And staying on the periphery keeps contact shallow, so you don't get that. 
That's what we want at first, is to be out here. That's how we can keep from setting off old triggers. But shallow connections, they take a toll. The connectedness that you crave is more like a future fantasy. And in the present, you're still isolating. And then what starts as a kind of delay in your development can become a full-on deficiency. And next thing you know, you're getting more isolated than ever. That is how it happens. By playing it safe, you stay stuck. You need to be taking some risks to grow your comfort zone a little wider, a little wider. There are these normal ups and downs involved in having friends and being part of groups. If you're not continuously growing through experiencing the normal ups and downs of being in friendships and groups, you risk not only not being included anymore, but you can start to get like hard to include. And what it is, and this will sound harsh, but avoiding people leads to self-centeredness. Not sharing yourself with other people, it's an emergency protection measure, but it's not a way to live your whole life. The possibility of sharing yourself is all around you. You can agree to bring something to a potluck dinner, you can join a choir or take a quilting class or invite friends out for a hike. When you show up for people in your life, you grow less fragile and more flexible and more connected and more included. And yes, it's demanding to be included. And isolation sounds so peaceful as an option, but if you allow isolation to take root, long-term it will take over. And your very worst traits will have this huge, fertile, empty space to take root. People in isolation grow crabbier, they get more self-centered, they get more bitter, they get more paranoid. And then it gets harder to turn the ship like back towards connection again because you've gotten too eccentric, too awkward. I've called this turning weird on YouTube before. And some people have complained that I was being unfair, but I think it's fair. I know that isolation definitely made me a weirder version of myself. And I don't mean good weird. Have you ever felt this beginning to happen to you? Have you seen it in other people? I mean, I really noticed it in myself and other people, in fact, when lockdown was ending and I started being able to hang out with people again. I was rough on the edges. I talked too much. I wouldn't know what to say. I was a little angry, a little edgy. And gradually I kind of got my bearings again. So take your alone time and then keep chipping away at your capacity to stay connected. I know many of you watching this video are there right now wondering, if any change is possible or worth it. And I just wanna tell you, yes, it is possible and yes, it is worth it. You just start with one small action. You just show up. So I teach a bunch of ways to do this in my Connection Boot Camp. That's a 30-day course that helps you keep taking positive actions each day and you develop new skills for having relationships. You can explore that down in the description section. There's a link down there if you wanna check that out. But for today, take a shower, put on your coat, go say hello to some people, go back to a group you used to like, pay a visit to a friend you've been neglecting, sign up for you know a cleanup day at the beach or a blood drive or whatever community get togethers are just happening. It doesn't have to be really exciting. It just gets you out of the house so that you can show up. And if you do one thing like this every other day, in a couple of weeks, you're gonna find yourself included again. The need to be included is not just a weakness, it's primal. We're born into community and as much as we want to escape it sometimes and be independent, we never can be, not totally, not really. And evolutionary biologists will tell you it's a survival strategy so that you have warmth and food and protection from predators and so on. But it's not just physical. Inclusion is just as important for the growth and development of your being, your intellect, your spirit, because without inclusion in human relationships, the blossoming of, of your whole real self is arrested. It can't fully happen. Fulfillment cannot come to you. So being included and connected is also crucial for your physical health, for your brain health. It wards off dementia. It creates a support system of people who care about you and who can come to your aid if you're broke or lonely or feeling like your life is falling apart. You're not meant to go through all that alone. You've probably done it before, I have, but let's just say right now that we should never have to go through life's hardships alone ever again. 
Healing can bring that connection back to you. One-on-one -on -one relationships are one thing. If you have childhood PTSD, those can be just as hard as being part of a group. You need both. And I know it feels hard and that's because it is hard, but keep trying, keep participating. The reward for that is that you get to be included and included is secretly really what we all want. That's where we wanna be. Oh, it's so painful when you have to watch people you love make terrible mistakes. It's so easy to see in other people when they're walking into a trap, making the same mistake again that you can see coming from a mile away. And it's so tempting to tell them what you see when they don't want to hear it, right? Woe to you who double down and try to make them see the problem that you see. What you don't realize is that you actually don't know what's best for other people. And I'll explain why. My letter today is from a woman I'll call Cecilia. And she writes, Dear Fairy, thank you for your videos. It would be so interesting to see if you get confused by this too, or if this is super clear to you. I will share my latest story, but this is also very similar to other experiences I had in my life with friends. My question is about crippling confusion when you always are being left with no understanding of what happened in a situation, which makes me have no idea what to do next, feeling like I'm basically paralyzed. This was an online friendship. I'm 40 years old. I wrote to this person for a year and the last communication we had was about a job that this person felt that they had to take. I wrote why I thought it was a bad idea straightforwardly and this person responded that I was totally right. Uh, her fake name, Linda, didn't want to take the job for the exact reasons I told her. It wasn't only a money thing, this was something more. She also said that everyone else just thought she should do it and that colleagues were pushing her to do it too. She felt forced to do it anyway, even if she felt it was wrong. Okay, so. My letter writer is telling me the story of a friendship she had online and this person was gonna take a job, but our letter writer thought it was a terrible idea. In retrospect, I maybe should have just wrote that I support any decision you make, Linda, but the truth is that I was not supportive <laughs> because this was a job that went totally against her nature on every single level. I've got the fairy pencil. Let's circle what I want to come back to. I'm going to read the letter through and then I'll, I'll come back to some things I circled. All right, so our letter writer, um, Cecilia says, I would say it was kind of self-harming too, taking this job for her. So I responded to her a week later that she should still not take the job and things will work out anyway. And I kept believing very strongly about it that she would hopefully change her mind and know that I was on her side. Okay, so our letter writer was really pressuring her friend more not to take the job. So weeks went by with no response from her friend Linda, but one day she saw that Linda had taken that job anyway, the job that our letter writer had warned her about. She says, I never heard anything back again. I'm kind of pragmatic, so I never send any why don't you respond messages, because I do believe people will reach out if they want me in their life. And if I don't hear back, I have to take that as a bad sign and just keep myself out. Yeah, this is a way to avoid fooling myself into delusion that this person really cares when all signs say the opposite. But several months later, I started to feel that same old feeling, thinking, hmm, maybe this is a misunderstanding. What if I was too judgmental? Things like that. I didn't want this person to feel like I was demanding any response because of her obvious silence, but the feeling of that it was maybe a misunderstanding was still haunting me. So I just sent an update about something I knew this person is obsessed about, which is dog shows. <laughs> I sent two to three sentences about it because I knew this news would make Linda so happy to see and perhaps an opening for her to see that I'm still here. I didn't mention the job in that message or any personal things at all. I was just wishing her my very best and sent this in a way to reassure her that I was fine with her job, but I can let it go by not bringing up the job and just talking about lighter topics. Okay. But I still didn't hear from Linda. The strange thing was that she did put the dog show news on her site for everyone to see directly after I sent it, um, as if this was her own finding. But she never mentioned me. I felt like it was sort of a punishment, but I'm not sure. I didn't reach out more after, after that short dog show message. 
To add more information about her, to make this even worse, is that she's living a very lonely life with no real life, life friends, no siblings, and never had any real friends in her life. And here's the big news. She recently quit that job I warned her about with the exact same explanation, using my exact words from my message where I lined up the reasons why she shouldn't take it in the first place. I saw this online. That's how I know. Linda seemed to pretend this was her own realization when it was really mine. <laughs> I was sometimes thinking about calling her out by sending her a message saying, stop using my thoughts, ideas as your own. But what good would come out of it? Nothing. I was interested to be her friend, not enemy, so I just let her pretend that this was her own thoughts and ideas. At the end of the day, I have no idea what happened here. I really don't. Fairy, you can be totally straightforward. I can take it. What I can't take is being left unsure about this very strange situation. Hope this is clear for you, when you uh, and hopefully you can clear up my confusion. It would help me so much <laughs> so that I can leave it behind and perhaps write to her again with something else. I have no idea. Best wishes from Cecilia. Okay, I think I can help. What an interesting letter. What a strange situation. <laughs> So Cecilia is our letter writer, Linda is her friend, and it's very confusing. Um, letter writer is 40 years old. She had an online friendship with somebody, and they, I guess they talked a lot, and the friend, Linda, was thinking of taking a job, and our letter writer is thinking, no, no, it's a terrible job, don't do it, it's bad for you, it's not what you want, it's, it's uh, self-harming. And the friend didn't listen to her. And I guess there was a lot of pressure applied. All right. So, Cecilia, I can just say that um, there's so many things that are charming and lovable in your letter, but it, I feel like you're not having self-awareness that when somebody else is deciding to take a job, if they ask you what you think, you can say, oh, I think it's a terrible idea. But if you pressure them and pressure them to go against what, what they think is the best decision for them, that is going to be damaging to the friendship. There are very few people who want to be pressured and told what to do. And so I have a definition for that word for you. When, when we think that we know what's best for another person, that they're just being dumb, they're not seeing the obvious, what that is called is arrogance. That's what it is. So I'm not trying to be hard on you, but you're just wondering like, what happened? Why did this friend bail on you? And this is, to me, this is the most obvious thing. You, you got like right up in her space and you told her what she should do and you went against her judgment. And here's the thing. We cannot know what is best for another person. I know you know your friend. I know you saw things in this job that you expected she wouldn't like, but you still don't get to put pressure on another person like that because they're, they're, they're making the best decision they can. Perhaps part of her learning was to, you know, take a job that had some red flags and then realize that she wasn't happy and that she needed to see the red flags. That's how we learn. So that's the, you know, worst case scenario is that she still hasn't learned how to see red flags and you were right about everything. But here's, then I thought, okay, well maybe Cecilia is just a little bit pushy or opinionated. But here's the tell, okay, when you said that you didn't hear from her and then you saw that she quit her job for the same reasons you warned her about, that you felt like somehow you had a copyright on those reasons. It's almost, you know, you said it wasn't even, you know, I sent it and she quoted it like it was her own finding, but she never mentioned you. And it may have been a punishment, but honestly, if you were right about it, she was sooner or later going to see that you were right. It was the pressure. It was the pressure. And I can just see the pressure because it's weird. You want credit, credit for seeing it coming. And if you want a friendship tip, when you see that they made a mistake and you tell them and they go ahead and make the mistake anyway, if you're a good friend, you don't say, I told you so. You don't say, what did I tell you? That's actually really mean. <laughs> and, um, it's very easy for us to think that if we were in somebody else's shoes, we would make these great decisions. But if that were true, why are we friends with people like this, right? Why are we, <laughs> why do, it, who among us can actually like avoid making mistakes of this type? So we don't know. And um, personal freedom and autonomy is just so important. People need to make their own mistakes. And who knows, maybe it wasn't a mistake. So then you said, you, it bothered you that she used your exact same explanations of why she didn't like the job. And you thought about like confronting her about copying you. And I was just like, you know what? 
this doesn't sound quite right to me. Something's not right with your thinking there. Um, the reasons that you predicted turned out to be the reasons she didn't like it, and it's not copying you. So I was just going to say, you said be straight with you, you could take it, and I just think you're being very unfair to your former friend, thinking that they should take your advice no matter what, and they should never have the same reason for leaving a job that you predicted. That's Something's not right here. One really hard but ultimately positive part of healing your past trauma is when the friends who used to be a great match for you just don't fit anymore because you're changing. Now, some people don't want you to change and some are okay with it, but the way that they're dysfunctional will gradually start to be more visible to you as you heal your own dysfunction. And it's easy to think on any given day that, you know, you're all healed now and maybe even you would look down on people who are still stuck in their trauma-driven behaviors. It's okay to set your boundaries on behaviors you don't want in your life anymore, but I want to show you a middle ground between codependently hanging out with people who are still dysfunctional, even though they drag you down, and on the other hand, treating them like they're, you know, evil or, you know, treating them with contempt. There's a place for them in your life, but with boundaries. So this often happens when people have begun to emerge from trauma-driven living, but they haven't yet learned to set boundaries. Totally normal phase of healing. So my letter today is from someone I'll call Riley, and she writes, Hello, Anna. Thank you for all you do for so many people. I just broke off a four-year friendship with a friend who goes into a rage. I ended contact with her two years ago and resumed contact with her a year ago, assuming that we both had grown in our recovery. All right, I'm circling things with the, my pink pencil here today, and I'm going to come back to some of this. Let's just read through Riley's letter, and I can see what's going on, and then see if I can help. What precipitated the final breakup was her raging at me and cursing at me because I had refused to pay the valet for her car. She threatened to make me get out of her car and cursed at me. I knew there was no point in arguing with her in the state she was in, so I sat silently along the way, said a terse goodbye, then got out, got into my car, and left. I texted her that night to tell her that I wanted to end the relationship and then blocked her phone number. We still have a recovery meeting in common. At this point, I want nothing to do with her. I want nothing else to do with her. If I were to see her at the meeting, I don't even want to acknowledge her presence, not to punish her, but to show myself enough respect that I decide who has a place in my life. Would you say hello to such a person? I won't leave that meeting as I have a leadership role and a sponsee with whom I support, but I don't feel any need to engage with this former friend, either verbally or via technology. Please offer your thoughts if you're willing. Thank you, Riley. All right, I love that you have a recovery meeting that you go to, that's really positive. So I wanna tell you something based on my experience. I know how it is when you are actively working on your healing, which you are, um, you are going to go through changes. But when you're in a recovery meeting, by its nature, everyone in that meeting has problems. So I think there's this expectation sometimes when people get into a 12-step program or something, they go, oh my gosh, you know, um, uh, there was this guy, he hit on me, what a terrible program. Hey, you know, people go to the, they go to these meetings because they are struggling. So a person needs to have boundaries at meetings, and often when you first get there, you don't have boundaries, and you don't have a red flag detector. So I see what happened here. You got there, and in your earlier phase of recovery, you became friends with somebody who would rage at you. And probably there's something in your past and your programming that made you think, oh, that's okay, I can put up with raging. And you just got to a point in your healing when you're like, no, I cannot put up with people raging at me. I don't want to do it anymore. And you set a boundary, so that's good. You got out of the car, you ended the relationship, great. So here's the thing, you are seeing each other in meetings now, and you even have somebody you sponsor who is seeing how you act. So I don't know about you, but there's a pretty big emphasis in 12-step in recovery on dealing with resentment. So when you um, continue to see a friend who really made you angry, you didn't like how she treated you, it doesn't really have anything to do with respect. I get that it feels like self-respect to give her the silent treatment, but the silent treatment, I, 
there's a there's a middle ground here. Let me just tell you what it is. I've had plenty of people, you know, burn me. And I've had, I, there was somebody I sponsored once who just, she spread all these like nasty rumors about me. It affected my reputation with people. I was really offended. I ran into her not that long ago and she's like, hey, how's it going? And I was just like, it's going all right. And um, I heard that she told people that we were all patched up and it's not patched up. She never acknowledged what she did. And, uh, you know, it's still, I still feel like, ooh, danger person, you know, don't let this person into your life. But I'm totally polite. I'm totally polite to everybody I see in a meeting because a meeting is a place where everybody needs to be there for their healing. And if anybody has made it that far, they just kind of deserve a little bubble of, um, decency. Now that doesn't, a boundary doesn't mean you have to give the silent treatment. That's not a boundary. A boundary is you don't hang out with them. You don't maybe talk about personal things, but I see no reason you can't go hello when you walk in and leave, not to be a big drama show. You know, you don't want to bring drama into a meeting. You don't want to um, model behavior that you punish people who are in a 12-step meeting because, because they still have very, very common symptoms of things that go along with 12-step problems. I don't know what your fellowship is here, but whether it's AA or Al-Anon or something, yeah, people fly into a rage. That's why they're there. So I encourage you to focus on your recovery, work with your sponsor to deal with your resentment about this and with your sense that you don't have adequate ways of protecting yourself from treatment like this. You do. You have your awakened mind so that you don't get into friendships like that anymore. You don't have to anymore. And sometimes, you know, it, it happens. It's so normal. But that is one of the things that characterizes friendships um, it's a terrific thing. I know when I got into recovery, I was so grateful to have a group full of people and instant friends and people I could hang out with. And I went through these growing pains where, you know, sometimes people, they were, they would be really nice. And then all of a sudden they would blow up or they, or they would, um, I don't know, just be gossipy or blamey. It didn't happen very often. I mean, the ratio of like difficulty with people compared to all the great things I got out of it was small. But I remember my sponsor told me, it's like, hey, this is 12-step recovery. <laughs> this is why people come. And I guess I had had this, I had a fantasy. I had this idealization that everybody there was all, all recovered now and they had scooped me up. But actually, you know, within a not that long amount of a time, I became one of the people who was supporting other people. And I always, always tried to be polite and, you know, civil to everybody. <sighs> Weird stuff happens, right? I had somebody in a meeting once she was, she came in and was very disruptive. She started interrupting everything that was said and you know, demanding that she have the floor for all this resentment she had. And I spoke up and I said, hey, you have to raise your hand like everybody else. And a lot of people were really angry that I said that, but that's what I thought was the right thing. You know, you don't get to just go in and start interrupting the whole thing and somebody will speak up with you. That's just sane. So just as an example, boundaries, you're allowed to have boundaries. You're allowed to tell people to stop. You're allowed to get out of the car. You're allowed to block contact, but I just would not give the silent treatment in the context of a recovery meeting. You don't need to. Um, if you are fearful that that gives her the idea that she can come and attack you, it's not so. You have a boundary. And I think what you said is, I won't leave the meeting, but I don't feel the need to engage. Oh, that's what it is. Um, I, I want, I don't want to acknowledge her presence, not to punish her. I'm sorry. It is punishment. It is. But to show myself enough respect that I decide who has a place in my life. I want you to respect yourself and I want you to decide who has a place in your life. And n giving somebody the silent treatment changes nothing about your difficulty with those boundaries. Your continued recovery always is going to depend on facing and getting free from um, this, the resentful ways that you've tried to protect yourself from difficult people. You're just like us, you know, you're just like everybody. It's normal, but as you recover, terrible treatment, silent treatment, it, that sort of thing, it's, um, it's not necessary for you to have boundaries. What if you got so good at trying to be nice and appropriate and likable that you succeeded in suppressing your real self? and all the friends that you'd ever known had only gotten to know this fake version of you. I'll tell you what happens. The friendships that you develop just tend to fritter away. There's very little there. 
And that's what happens so much of the time when you're a person who grew up with childhood trauma and you've been fighting that, that like rough side of you that comes out when you're triggered, when you've been suppressing it instead of healing it. All right. Complex PTSD, and that's the kind of PTSD that develops after chronic ongoing trauma, like being an abused kid or a neglected kid. It has some really harsh symptoms that are not fun for people to be around. Okay. And if you're watching this because you had trauma, I know that you know exactly what I'm talking about. It's not your fault. You were traumatized, but now you may have this harsh side that comes out and gets too angry or too needy or falls too much in love, or you get too jealous, or you're just, I don't know, too traumatized to be accepted by other people that really can happen. And you may have been living in fear that they would see that part of you. People with CPTSD have this kind of like unfortunate habit of fleeing relationships. And there's different ways to do it. You can blow them up with anger. You can abandon the person. You can get all obsessed on them, which is another form of abandoning them or with this sort of covert avoidance strategy of trying to be nice, being so nice. Like how could they ever leave? And that's how a good number of us end up alone and completely baffled why we keep losing friends and partners when we've actually been so nice. All right. I have a letter today from someone I'll call Carla. She says, dear fairy, I am so humiliated. I keep thinking I've made connections only to be ghosted over and over again. And it's breaking my heart. I'm a heterosexual woman, 63 years old. And I meet a potential friend thinking that I'm making a friend, making a connection. Maybe it goes over months, maybe even years. These are people who I sincerely like, who I want to be friends with. And I consciously measure my behavior so that I am not always talking about my pain or trauma. I'm giving them space to come forward and I can retreat without putting pressure on them. I feel like I'm finally making friends when this happens. I don't hear from them for a while. I give them space. And then I find out after months that they've been living the life. They've been going out, having fun, meeting new people, getting into relationships and so on while I've been at home alone, being concerned for them because I haven't heard from them. And then it hits me. I've been ghosted. They've been around. They just haven't wanted to be with me or even check in. And I'm hurt and mortified that I've been concerned for them while I've been living a lonely, solitary life. And I sincerely have no idea what happened. Just, I'm going to keep reading, but I'm going to circle the word concerned for them. Okay. <laughs> Case in point, I was working with a group of young women. We'd regularly go out for lunch, taking whoever's car. I was so happy to finally be part of a team. And then my car broke down. It took exactly a week to realize that without my car, I was nothing. They would go off for lunch without me, no invitations. How could I have gone for a couple of years without realizing none of them even liked me? That's the part that's so mortifying. I'm too stupid to live. I'm going to circle that too, Carla. That's a terrible thing to say. We'll come back to that. Okay. And it's not even about dating men because I so rarely do. And I'd like to be in a relationship, but baby steps, I guess. It's about making friends, having a best friend, one of my most cherished dreams. At 63 and still trying to establish friendships, I'm effing disconsolate. Fairy, I can't help thinking something must be desperately wrong with me to be this age and still trying to make friends, realizing I've been living a total crap fit life. Crap fit for anyone who doesn't know is a word in the, in, in my videos for when we fit ourselves to crappy situations. Finding the crappy childhood fairy has been one of the best blessings of my life. Finally, someone gets me after decades of seeking help. I've started the daily practice, which I love and have signed up for the healing childhood PTSD course. My question is how do I manage these heartbreaks in the meantime? How do I develop some sort of confidence when all my connecting isn't connecting? How do I even begin to date under these conditions? What little self-esteem I had is being systematically eroded and it's all I can do not to just close my heart and never try to make connections again. I think we know the feeling. If it weren't for the crumbs, I would have nothing. Oh, I'm going to circle that too. I hope you can provide some words of comfort or advice, not tough love because I'm already crushed. 
Thank you. And thank you for all you do. You've given me hope, Carla. Okay. No tough love here for you, Carla, today. Just love. All right. Just love for you. You have childhood PTSD. And what you're describing is what so many of us have struggled with. And I started out this video talking about the phenomenon of fake friends. These friendships tend to develop when we had the idea that we had to totally suppress our real selves, like you did here, where you were saying you were so good. You measure your behavior. You don't talk about your pain or trauma. And I agree, that's good. But you're also saying I give them space to come forward and I retreat so that they don't have pressure. That's all really good. But when I look at your whole letter, I just see a woman whose heart is completely good, who wants something totally normal, who's trying to squish herself into something that people like. And you know what the big thing I circled here was? And this is a clue. And I don't know if this is going on in the big picture for you, but your case in point is I was working with a group of young women. All right, you're 63. All right, I'm close to your age. So there's no shame in being 63, but you know who the good friends for a 63 year old are, are other people who are roughly in that age category. All right, we, I have a lot of friends of all ages, but like close friends, they're not going to be a group of young women. You know what the group of young women are doing? They're doing something totally different. And if you can remember being a young woman, you liked people. You, you, you think they never even liked you. I bet they did like you. They had lunch with you, but they're a group of young women with young woman concerns and young woman relatedness. And of course they're going to gravitate towards hanging out as a group and not even think to invite someone who's a generation older. That's not anything terrible. It's really important to just sort of go, you know what, this is not, you didn't do anything wrong here. You didn't do anything wrong except for be somebody who's totally open-minded about age. All right. And I kind of relate to that. I meet people and I like them. And then gradually, as I know them, I find out they're like 30 years younger than me. And like, it never occurred to me, we were like different generations. And likewise for people who are much older than me, like it just, I don't even think about it. I just kind of like people and, um, but I'll tell you what, when I was young, I was very acutely aware of age. And I had that thing that young people have where you think older people don't really get it or they don't understand. And so you may have been looking for friendship in the wrong place. Um, and this was your job. So a bunch of people were going out to lunch, but these are not your potential best friends. So great. And this thing about the car, like you didn't realize it was the car. But I got to kind of wonder if there was some unconscious level where you wanted to be friends with them so much that you were thinking of ways. It's like, what can I do? What can I do for them? So another thing that I circled in your letter was this thing that I was home being concerned for them. Now, this is a little different. I just did a video recently about something I call concern shaming and concern shaming. This is not what you're doing, but concern shaming is when you say, I'm very concerned about you because actually I have this criticism of you. I want to ask you, do you think maybe your concern is not really concerned, but you're using the pretense of concern to actually kind of like yearn. It's more like yearning. I'm yearning for you. And you say, well, I'm concerned. You didn't call me and I'm concerned something's wrong. I would just say that doesn't seem very realistic that if you have a friend and you haven't heard from them for a while to worry that something, you know, that they've died or, you know, ended up in a, in a psych hospital or something, that's probably not the case. I think it's, you know, people come and they go, people come and they go. And I have people who are very good friends and I don't talk to them sometimes for years. And then when we talk, it's great to talk and we feel really close and then we move on. And I'm thinking of this friend. She was so incredible, so kind, so generous. She still is. She's still my friend. But there was a time when I first got engaged, my kids were small and I was engaged and she was single and she was between jobs and she was figuring out what she was going to be doing in her life. So we were in these very different places in our lives. And I think we've all been on either side of that. I was really busy. I had, you know, this, I was in love and my very dear friend was still just having me as a friend. And she would call me and want to get together like every weekend. And I asked the person mentoring me at the time, I go, what do I do? Like, I just, I can't hang out every weekend, but I don't want to disappoint her. I don't want her to feel like I'm not her friend. And I got the suggestion. My friend said, you know what? My best friend, we hang out like once a month and it's a very strong friendship. And I thought about it. Like I have close friends 
that I only see every few years, if that. And when we do get together, it's very close. And I know they like me. They love me. I love them. So just because somebody doesn't want to hang out with you all the time doesn't mean they don't like you. You are not too stupid to live. You totally belong here. That thing where you are too stupid to live, that's a lie your CPTSD tells you. Just throw it out. No lies here. No, no room for that. You are supposed to be here and you're brilliant and you have an open heart and you want friends. But I know what's happening here because I've been in this place. A friend is a friend, a person who supports you and fills that space of a family or partner. That's another thing. And so when you're going into friendship with this tremendous imbalance that you don't have that person or you don't have the hope of that person and you're conflating the thing of like somebody who's nice to go to the movies with and go for a walk with the person who is going to be there for you day after day and go to your doctor visits with you and celebrate your birthday with you. That's a different role. That's the person who's missing right now. And it's totally normal what's happening, but that person not being in your life right now, when it's your desire to have that, it's putting a whole bunch of pressure on your friendships and your friends like you, but they're having to set a boundary on that because that's not what they need right now. And I think that two people who are in the same place of needing that close of a friend, like a, you know, almost like a surrogate family, like when people can match on that, it can go really well. And as somebody who like my family of origin is just about a hundred percent lost to me. And so I, I created a new family and there was this period of years between the two. And I was, um, I had a medical crisis. I was in and out of the hospital a lot. My family of origin wasn't, was hardly available to help me with that. I needed so much help. It went on for years. And I didn't have a partner. I didn't have a sibling in my life. I, I didn't have any of those people who are supposed to help you with that. And I remember I was going to this therapist at the time and I was just crying like, why is this so hard? Why do I have to suffer so much with all this medical stuff and kids? And the therapist just pointed out so kindly, like this is supposed to be the job of like a spouse or maybe a mother or maybe a sister, right? but I didn't have those people. I didn't have those people. And she suggested to me, and this was very good advice, like this is a long-term project, but it's time to build that. It's time to build that. And I feel very strongly that if you long to have a spouse, that that is a very good thing to start working on. You're 63, it, there's no time like the present. You can start working on that. And if you're serious about having a spouse, I think there's certain things that you would start to do differently. Honestly, people with childhood PTSD so often don't let them own that desire. So they put some little short-sighted thing, like you saying you want to date. And I get that dating is the first step, but I just encourage you, like, go ahead and expand that and just say, I would like to have my spouse. I would like to be married. I, I want that. I want somebody to be with me through thick and thin. I want somebody to go home with and spend holidays with and give birthday presents to and make their favorite food. And when I'm throwing up, I want them to help me out, and hold my hair out of my face. <laughs> I want a spouse and let yourself, let yourself want that. Just let yourself want that there. It's a beautiful and good thing to want and it's not impossible. And yes, young people with all their beautiful skin and everything and with their future of being able to have children, they're in a certain boat with that. Okay. So that's great. I'm so glad they're in that boat, but at 63, you have a slightly different type of relationship that's possible for you. And especially if you are this kind and caring person, you have so much to give. So I promised you we're going to talk about fake friends. I believe that what's happening for you is that you're forming fake friendships because you're not fully owning who you are, how you really feel and what you really want. To heck with being concerned about people who ghost you. Let go of all that concern. You get to be hurt and angry when people ghost you. You don't have to tell them. You can tell them if you want, but quit pretending that you're so nice that you don't need anything, that you're, you're merely concerned for others. That's just not even real. So it's time to start expressing yourself. No one 
can fall in love with this fake version of you. And this isn't something you're necessarily going to pull off in a flash. Okay. It takes practice and it takes a lot of personal power to become your real self. And I'll talk about the personal power in a moment, but here's how to start practicing being yourself. All right. I'm going to give you some suggestions of things you can start doing, uh, several of them a day, at least one a day. Okay. I want you to begin saying what you really feel and saying what you really think. I'm not saying go out there and intentionally hurt people's feelings, but have you not maybe suppressed yourself and played along and pretended to be nice when actually you had something to say, a preference, like, actually, I don't want to go to that restaurant. I want to go to this one. Or, um, I actually don't want those responsibilities on the job. I prefer to do this and I would like a raise, please. <laughs> You say what you really feel and what you really think. This is one of the things that starts to let you become yourself. Stop suppressing the truth. All right. Another thing you can do because you're going to need brain power. And I've, one of the things that I think is so forgotten that helps increase our intellectual strength is reading challenging books. So I don't know what you like to read or watch on TV. I certainly love to relax and watch junky TV shows, but I also try to read challenging books. And every time I do, I start to have new ideas, new inspirations, new things to talk about. And when I find myself in some social situation with people, I have something really interesting to contribute. And then I have much more capacity to be interested in what other people are saying. And we all know, that that's a lot where connection happens. You don't have to make them your best friend, but you just practice building your knowledge and having interesting things to say. So you're not just, you're not just approaching uh, people like a bee to a flower where you just need your pollen. You know, you're going there like, Hey, you know, <laughs> I was reading this great book. What do you think about this idea? That is something a lot easier for people to engage in and it doesn't feel needy. All right. Here's another suggestion for you. And this is just a wild guess, but I'm going to think because you've been playing nice <laughs> and because I suspect that you were neglected as a kid and you weren't listened to that there was a lot of emotional neglect. I would like you to practice at least once in a while, maybe once a week dressing beautifully with color and style. This is something I have to work on. A lot of my childhood trauma is expressed with like, not bothering with nice things for myself, stop dressing down, dress beautifully, just build yourself up and then walk around being dressed more beautifully than you're used to. And just feel that. Okay. Feel you being you. And if you don't have a lot of money, you have a job, so that should be sort of easy. But for anybody who doesn't have a lot of money, personally, I love thrift shops. <laughs> I love thrift shops. And I love getting oddball things to wear like completely loud necklaces <laughs> and brightly colored shirts. I really enjoy sometimes just kind of splashing out and, and dressing for the extravagant side of myself. All right. Here's one of the hardest things. I think this might be hard for you, but to be more authentic in yourself. And that's to stop doing things that you don't want to do. What I would encourage you to start doing is get into a group where it's not dependent on friendship. Nobody has to give you permission to be in the group. And I'm thinking maybe a 12 step program like CODA. There's a little bit of what I'm hearing as codependence here in trying to be nice and being concerned about them when they don't show up. That sounds a little bit like codependence. And I used to poo poo the idea of codependence until I realized actually until I had like a toxically codependent person in my life. And, uh, they hurt me very much, honestly, with their pretend concern and pretend fixing. Um, it's not good to be codependent. It's really good to be yourself. It's really lovable to be yourself. And in a 12 step group, you get to show up, you get to talk, you get to get to know people. And it's not always this big social pressure thing. Like everybody just comes and then everybody goes home. All right. Very nice, very easy. Lots of practice connecting with people and paying attention and just learning like, what do other people go through? What is hard for them? What are they good at? If you're honest there, and if you actually like participate and get a sponsor and work the steps there, you, really good things begin to happen. That's my experience. All right. And I promised I'd talk about the, the part about personal power. I'm going to suggest that you stop presenting yourself as a person who 
doesn't make any trouble. Like I don't need anything, but all I do is like offer my car and, um, I don't talk about my trauma and, and I agree, like it's not appropriate to talk about our trauma to every Johnny come lately, right? It's, it's too much information and it just gets us all triggered and makes things weird, but you do get to be you. You do deserve friends where at some point along the road, you do get to open up to each other and you do it in little increments, but your personal power is coming from you being you and you beginning to express yourself. When you hide that part of yourself, it makes you incredibly hard to get close to. And what other people may have experienced trying to be friends with you or dating you is that when they start talking about something and you start dancing around trying to be nice and hide the problem and the trauma and everything, what they're seeing is just kind of like flatness. They're not really seeing anything that they can connect on a heart level to. All right. And when you're trying to like placate everybody and be not too much for them, I'm not too much. And somehow I have an intuition that you got told this as a kid, like your needs are too much, right? But when you're in that place of kind of going, no, no, be my friend. You know, I'm not too much. I promise I won't need very much. I just feel like crying, you know, I've been there too. And the energy that you have when you're doing that, it's like pursuit. It's like you're chasing someone. And all of us have an instinct to be wary of people who are sort of trying too hard. That's why we don't like door to door salespeople and things. You know, we just like, we're wary about that. Um, that sort of like pushing in of people. So I heard you, you, you're saying you give them space and you do that. So I know, you know that, but there's this weird way that controlling yourself on that all the time might just be making you impossible to connect with. So you, you didn't specify what it is that you're suppressing from other people, what you think that they can't accept about you. And I don't know, um, the likely culprits for people with CPTSD is anger. You know, you get bitchy maybe or sharp with people. I don't think that's you, or you think you're not enough in some way, or you think you're too much. And I'm guessing that you're somewhere wobbling around. I'm too much. I'm not enough. I'm too much. I'm not enough. All right. That all has to go. You're exactly right. You're exactly right, Carla. I'm so glad you wrote this letter and I just want to encourage you to start being yourself and go into your personal power of being yourself and the lovable woman who you are, who owns what she really wants. I'm not talking about being pushy, but just to say, yeah, I want love. I want friends. I'm working on it. It's a, it's a lovely and beautiful and holy desire to want to be connected with people and when you can accept that in yourself, I think you're going to find that the wind is under your wings and it's going to help you along the way. I wish you luck. I send you love. When you heal from your childhood trauma, just about everything in your life gets better, but there's this one thing that can get really hard. And that's that sometimes you're going to outgrow your old friendships. And I have a letter today from someone who I will call Tina. And she's describing what it's like to get together with old friends who are still in the CPTSD frame of mind that she's already left behind. And she writes, Hi, Anna. I have CPTSD from a very neglectful and abusive childhood, then an abusive 25-year marriage, then an abusive boyfriend for five years. I am single now and not looking. Woot, woot. <laughs> I've done a lot of work on healing myself over the last two years. I'm so proud of you, Tina. I feel that I have come really far, but I have a lot of healing to do. We all do. I practice daily writing and grounding in my garden along with other relaxation methods. Good. And I want to finally have a safe, happy life and hopefully marriage one day. Good goal. I have two really close friends that I've known for decades. We initially bonded over our similar childhood experiences and how many strong, positive traits we have in common. They've been there for me during the most difficult times in my adult life. One friend seems stuck in fight mode. Everything is a fight with her. Now she's referring here, Tina's referring to the fight or flight response or fight, flight or freeze response. Or now, thanks to Pete Walker, there's a fourth response named and defined and that's fawn. Fight, flight, freeze, fawn. These are nervous system reactions to stressful situations and they're set off by the brain and the autonomic nervous system. And so when you, let's say you almost get hit by a car, your, your body will go and you'll run out of the way, right? And your heart will be pounding and cortisol will be going. And all of that was designed to help you. Well, with childhood trauma, sometimes we get stuck in trauma reactions just about 
little things where actually we don't need to run out of the way. Um, and another form it can take is the fight response. So let's say a predator comes up, you know, a lion jumps on you and you have to fight the lion. Well, we get that response also from abuse. And then we can end up having an involuntary fight reaction when we're just having a conversation at the supermarket. And that's a lot of what is difficult about handling untreated complex PTSD from, from abuse and neglect in childhood. The freeze response is when somebody kind of spaces out or uh, can't really, you know, just get stuck in the same spot and doesn't know what to say or how to react to a threat. The fawn response is, is when a person tries suddenly to be a great people pleaser. It's like, oh, don't be mad, don't be mad. We try to placate and calm them. And most of us cycle around to all four of those responses, fight, flight, freeze, or fawn. And we often favor one of them. You know, you might have one that's the dominant one in you. So in Tina's letter, she's describing a friend who's stuck in fight mode. Everything is a fight with her. She argues with cashiers at the store. She flies off the handle in huge disproportionate ways over the smallest slight from strangers. Her kids will say or do something wrong and she will hurricane. I've never heard that word, but I love it to hurricane, a verb. <laughs> I get it. I don't even need an explanation. She will hurricane lecturing and making them give these overly complicated apologies to everyone even people who were not present or involved in the quote offense. She fights with people on the internet and every neighbor she's ever had. Her childhood and marriage were horrifically violent. She acknowledges that she has CPTSD, but she says it's too much to face the healing work. I'm almost never the recipient of her storming, but it stresses me out to see her doing it to others. Yeah, I'd feel the same way. I've come to recognize that my go-to PTSD response is fawning. And we talked about what fawning is, right? People pleasing. So Tina writes, when my friend gets like this, I find myself trying to soothe the situation or create some distraction to stop her over the top response. I feel great fear. My other friend, she says, is stuck in flight, <laughs> flight response. A fact she readily states about herself. She and I like to watch your videos together and discuss them. She was violently, physically, and sexually assaulted from toddlerhood, then abandoned and homeless by age 12. Oh my gosh. She admits she has CPTSD too. Okay. Well, I'm so sorry. But periodically, she just abandons our decades-old friendship with no warning and no explanation. Often it happens after we have just shared a wonderful day together. She also does this to her mom, sister, and adult kids. So that's what she means by flight. She just evacuates the relationship periodically. She will not answer my calls and replies with short texts only, saying how much she misses our friendship, but she stays cold and distant. It is so hurtful and at times leaves me in the lurch when we have agreed to do something or work together on projects. Then weeks or even months later, she suddenly pops back up like nothing happened and does not want to talk about it other than to apologize profusely and promise never to do that to me again. She's been doing this to me for 30 years. No matter how I explain the abandonment trauma, it causes me. Yeah. She refuses to take any actual action to change this or do any real healing work. I love my dear old friends. We've shared so many experiences and laughs and hurts. We've always been this motley crew of walking wounded until I began doing all this healing work. Now, after all their dysregulated behaviors, I feel exhausted and foggy headed. My question is this, I know I can't do my wounded friends healing work, but I also can't bear the idea of them being out of my life. I really love them so much. They are my support and safety net. They can't help the way that life has made them any more than I can. My heart is filled with compassion for their pain and lost childhoods. Do you think someone like me with life-altering CPTSD can be close to unhealed wounded people and still heal? Or is continuing to experience their trauma keeping me from moving on into healthy relationships? Is there a way to help our dysregulated loved ones without being sucked in ourselves? Do you think getting healthy means leaving behind those we were unhealthy with before we healed? Thank you for reading this and for any thoughts you want to share. Okay. Tina, thank you for this so much. I think a lot of people have this issue. And this is what happens when we start healing. We begin to outgrow the people we used to hang out with. 
What I hear you saying, though, is that there's still a lot of good stuff about these friendships. And so in your case, I'm going to say, yes, I think you can stay friends with these people. I think that's certainly a possibility. And it will help you to find a way to not get sucked back in. I hear you're getting foggy headed and stressed out that it's really affecting you. You know, honestly, as you heal, if you have CPTSD and people trigger you anyway, that even your healthiest friends, you're going to need techniques for holding boundaries and taking care of yourself and managing your triggers and your dysregulation. So that's all okay. If your friends are still giving you joy and it still is like a home for you to go home to, to be with them, I, I think it's great that you're keeping them. But here's the trick. It's boundaries. And I pulled out these tips that I have for people who are thinking about going home for the holidays. All right. And this is kind of similar. Not all of it. I know that you know, good friends, this is a very voluntary arrangement. It's not quite the same as going home and visiting a parent, um, someplace where there's a lot of duty. You don't have this duty going on here, but you just want to hang out with your, with your good friends. So I'm going to pull out some of the 10 tips that I give to people who are going home, to parents. All right, one of them is when you go, you own the decision to go, which you already do, but just plan it slowly. Just take your time to think through a little bit, like what are likely to be the situations where your friend who fights, the one who argues, what are the situations where she, that, that she's a little likely to get into something with that? And how are you going to have a plan B so that you can sort of not be present for it? Like, let's say if it's the supermarket for her, right? That she's going to end up yelling at the cashier. You can wait in the car when she goes in and the important thing is you don't tell her like, look, I, I don't want to go in the store with you because I know that you're very likely to get into an argument with the cashier. You don't say that. You just say, would it be okay if I hang out in the car? And that's the beauty of it. Setting boundaries doesn't have to be a big thing where you tell people that they're, they've done something wrong or you expect that they're going to let you down in some way. It's just a way that you can quietly take care of yourself and stay out of the situations that tend to suck you into the big black hole of dysregulation from being around it. And people do that. Being around a dysregulated person can be dysregulating, but it doesn't have to be. Another thing you can do is your daily practice. And I know like, let's say you were, you got together with your friends for some um, weekend, you know, at an Airbnb or something. And every morning and every evening, you wanted to be writing and meditating and using your relaxation techniques to keep taking care of yourself. I know how tempting it is when you're around people who are dysregulated, so you're starting to kind of like abandon yourself already, and it's time for you to do, to like do your meditation <laughs> and they're in a hurry and they want to hurry up and go to dinner. <laughs> it's very tempting to just go along with it. So this is a really important thing is to do the things that take care of you. Like, um, you know, limit alcohol or don't drink, get your sleep, Get, do your meditation. If you use my daily practice like twice a day, make time for it and just be cool about it. Don't ever lecture people. Don't ever tell them they ought to do it. Just say, I need to do my thing. Would that be okay? The best way, if you're ever going to influence them to be interested too in, in healing is to just when, to become different. They will see the difference in you. And when the chips are down and they're feeling kind of open-minded about something, they might ask you how, how you did it and be open to learning. Some people seem to have a gift for this of being able to, to influence other people who aren't doing it yet. And funnily enough, even though I talk about this on YouTube and now, you know, thousands of people are using the daily practice in my life, if I go up to people and believe me, there are many people where I'm like, you really should do this. It'd be better for me if you did. When I tell people, when I suggest to them that they do what I do, it's offensive. It's offensive, right? They don't like it. It tends to discourage them from doing it and has the opposite effect of what I would have wanted. So I've just found the best way to influence people to do their own healing is to heal myself and, and then, you know, let them come to me if they're interested. Rarely happens. All right. But, but that's okay. We can still love and be close to people who are still in it and having some healing ourselves, even if they're not interested in emulating us, it still has, it, it rubs off on them. We can be a calming presence the way that dysregulation is contagious, contagious, so is re-regulation. So being re-regulated in their presence can be really calming. And the perspective that we get as people who are able to re-regulate, our perspective on life can be really helpful to people 
who are struggling with their perspective. And like our perspective is one of the first things to get damaged with complex PTSD, right? Very hard to interpret what's really happening. Where are people coming from? What does everything mean? And in that turmoil, a lot of fear and resentment can, can well up. You know, I think everybody's judging me and therefore I hate them. And that's a lot what you're seeing in people's, um, you know, trauma reactions. Um, the flight friend that, yeah, I have people like that too. And it's so hard for me because I also have an abandonment wound. When people do that, it's very hard for me to recognize, oh, they're having the flight response. And I think that's, it's as involuntary as the fight, flight, flee, all of it. It's all a nervous system reaction that we're not doing on purpose. We're not doing it on purpose and people are not doing it to us. And so I love that you're aware of what they're doing. You have insight about why they're like that. One of your friends in particular has had a horrific background. And I think that at a certain point, what we have to ask ourselves is, are we willing to just love people as they are, even though they come and go like that? And the more we can step into that role of, of loving people as they are, the less triggering their behavior is. That kind of love that we have to extend to other people has a protective effect on our own hearts. You know, we're human. We have our own thing. <laughs> you have fawning. You want to make it okay for everybody, but you're well on your way toward healing. That fawning is going to be calming down. And in place of fawning, you're going to begin to step back and let go and just let people have the natural consequences of what's happening. So your friend gets into an argument with somebody, you can step out of the situation. You don't have to be involved in that. You can let her natural consequences unfold. And perhaps if she's in enough pain about it, she'll consult you one day for some advice. And the friend who leaves, um, I think it's very difficult to push somebody who needs to get away from everybody to push them into hanging out with people. It doesn't seem to serve to push people against their, their autonomic nervous system response. Like they're going to do that until they don't need to anymore. And they may never not need to. If they're not healing and they're able to like function in life and nothing is making it necessary for them to heal, they might not. It's totally okay. You have my permission to love them anyway. All right. So you have your boundaries, right? And when you set your boundaries, if you need to communicate them, you want to do them with as little judgment or criticism as possible. You don't want to use boundaries as a way to hurt people. And I'm not hearing that you do, but it's just something to keep in mind. It's just to go, hey, everybody, you know, I'm getting kind of frazzled. You guys carry on. I'm going to go do my writing and meditation. I'll be back in half an hour. All right. See you soon. Thanks for waiting. Um, and when you do that confidently, other people will accept it. When you do that with great apologies, you know, the, they will think you're doing something wrong. So take it from me. I've had to like have this boundary and take care of myself around other people. And sometimes they find it inconvenient that I need to do that, but oh, well, <laughs> you know, I'm not going to fawn over it. I do need to take care of myself or I'm going to show up bitchy, right? Okay. So another one is you don't have to talk to people about your trauma or the things you're doing about it. You do not have to talk about that. For people who are not in any kind of recovery themselves, this will often be a trigger. If you talk about your recovery, they will take it as an implied judgment. Sometimes even just, just like feeling better in their presence is going to feel like judgment to them. So I'm not saying that you should kowtow and fawn over that, but, but there's no need to tell them what you're doing. If they ask, tell them, keep it kind of low key, keep it humble. Don't act like, oh my gosh, this is the most amazing thing. Everyone should do this. That kind of thing is always going to push people away. They don't need to know. Um, maybe one day they'll have the experience themselves. One is you can limit the time that you spend in these situations where people's behavior is likely to come up or they might be difficult for you to deal with. You can limit your time in situations. This is a really important thing if people are going to be triggering for you to be around. If you're dreading, you worried they're going to get into a weird situation, everybody's going to say, um, go connect with a group of friends, but you know this one friend is really going to be very triggered by that. You can say, you know what, um, I'm going to join you guys just for the tail end of that dinner. I want to see everybody. But you get to take care of yourself by limiting time. And a lot of us with CPTSD, like we can hold it together for 30 minutes or maybe an hour, but we can't do four hours. And if it's an all afternoon hangout or something, you know, we, we can start to sort of get unraveled by it. So just try to know your limits and go ahead and build in kind, gentle reasons why you have a time limit on it. 
All right. You can also avoid unnecessary conflicts. So that is like, don't bring up controversial topics with them. Um, don't try to resolve big problems. Remember that your goal is to enjoy your friends there. You don't have to work out every conflict that's ever come between you. You don't have to talk about politics. You don't have to talk about religion or any of the things that have ever been kind of difficult for you. And finally, if you're really worried about an interaction or a visit with people, have a plan B. Just have a fallback plan. And this would, this could mean something like taking your own car to a get together, not relying on somebody else for a ride and getting stuck there or making sure that you have a ride sharing app and you have your phone and you just have a way to remove yourself from a situation that's getting to be too much for you. So those are what it is, you know, have taking care of yourself physically, having boundaries and thinking ahead about what might be triggering for you, having a plan B, and then as kindly and gently as you can, just have your boundaries in your plan B without ever anybody knowing if you can help it, that you're having to set boundaries and putting up little protections for yourself against behaviors that you find hard to deal with. That will help both of you enjoy the friendship and be there for each other. And you never know, healing might come to them one day. Every once in a while in your life, you're gonna meet someone, maybe a love interest or maybe just a potential friend who brings out the best in you. They get you. And when you're around them, you feel more alive. And what a good and happy thing this is, so rare. For some people though, especially if they were emotionally neglected or not seen by their parents when they were small, this special kind of adoration of another person can happen more than occasionally. And if it's feeling like the only thing that brings you to life, like it's all you have, if it's complicating your other real relationships, it might be a problem. My letter today is from a woman I'll call Madeline, and she writes, Hi, Anna. I have a question about limerence in friendships. I'm 20 years old, and I grew up in a family where both of my parents struggled with alcohol addiction. I'm going to read Madeline's letter all the way through, and then let's I'll come back and talk about the things I circled. All right. Uh, she says, my father has been an alcoholic for most of my life while being also emotionally distant. And my mother developed her alcohol problem just recently, about three years ago, after getting a divorce from my father because of it. My mom is also struggling with her mental health, having panic attacks almost every week, showing signs of depression and also having disordered eating. She did not want to get help for a long time, but unlike my father, was aware about her problem and willing to get better. Because of this, I've been feeling emotionally neglected for the past few years, as I had to regulate the feelings of my mom and other family members in order to keep the family in some kind of order. As a form of escape, I used to go to a local bar with my friends. I live in a small town, so everybody in this bar knew me and showered me with attention because I was young and pretty. It was at this bar where I met a guy that I cannot stop thinking about. First time I met him, he talked mostly to my friend, who's much more bubbly than me, and I just enjoyed their company. He was a musician, funny, intelligent, and I really admired his knowledge about music and art. It's quite hard to get me impressed, but with this guy, it happened quite quickly. At first, I thought he was just talking to us because he was interested in my friend, as most guys do, so I didn't pay much attention to him. I'm in a happy relationship of seven years, so I'm looking for some amusement when I go out rather than a flirt. However, after we met for the second time, we really clicked and spent all evening talking to each other. I was happy to get some attention from somebody who seemed to just get me, as I thought he was into my friend and his interest in me was actually sincere. Me and my friend and him and his friend decided to crash at his place, and in the morning, he told me in front of everybody that he liked me. I just smiled and said that it's okay, but he should have already known what my reaction was going to be, as he knew that I had a boyfriend. He was a bit of a flirt, so I knew that he would not take this attraction too seriously, and that it would not stand in the way of us being friends, which I suddenly so desperately wanted, she says. After that day, I could not stop thinking about him. I started to go to that bar more often, but he, on the other hand, started traveling more and I did not see him for months. When I finally saw him one day, he came right to our table to say hi and he complimented me on something I recently posted on social media. He was looking, <laughs> which I got a huge dopamine dose from. 
Although we did not see each other almost at all, he helped me to get a summer job in a company owned by his friend. So every day when I came to work, I was hoping he would stop by just so I could see him. And sometimes he did. I don't know what is wrong with me, although I can see his flaws. He drinks too much. He's 10 years older than me. He does not really have his life together. And I definitely do not want a romantic relationship with him. Still, a year later, after not seeing him for several months, I think about him and I just can't figure out why. I recently heard that he got a girlfriend, which he moved to another city with, and after hearing this news, I didn't feel hurt or jealous. I felt happy that he's doing fine and making good progress in his life. My question to you, Anna, is do you think someone can be limerent over a friend? I really just wanted him to be in my life, as I find him extremely interesting, caring, and fun to be around. I also kind of felt this way with my other very close friends in the past, where I was idolizing them, looking for every small sign that they cared about me, wanting to be with them all the time, and doing everything to please their expectations about me, which I later realized was really unhealthy. I would also get extremely hurt if they did something without me or didn't take me into consideration. In my romantic relationship, on the other hand, I've never felt like this, and I learned to express and communicate my needs, as well as to ask for attention when I need it. I just really cannot figure this out. Thank you for your answer. I love watching your videos and admire your work. Thank you. Okay. All right. Madeline, I can help, I think. This is kind of complicated. This is very complicated. I'll be interested in what everybody says. All right, so I circled a bunch of things. First of all, you're 20 years old. That is very young. I know everybody says that, and I don't say that as a put down, but just that a lot can change. And so when you say you're in a happy relationship of seven years, you guys have been together since you were 13. And I guess that's good. I think that's good. Occasionally that happens, and it's like a really solid relationship. But I would say, Given that your parents were alcoholic, I would just question a little bit about why you're in such a committed relationship at such a young age. But perhaps it's very good because you said that you can communicate your needs and it's really stable and you're happy. But you have this history of sort of getting friend limerent on people. And you know what? Yes, that is a thing. It can happen. And I don't know what happened in your other relationships, but this does sound a little bit limerent. But the very interesting that you're not jealous or sad that he found a girlfriend and moved away. That is that is interesting. So this sounds like a particular flavor of limerence that you have, that this became a big deal to you. But I have a thought about this. Okay. This stuff with your parents and their alcoholism, it's pretty extreme. And I'm so sorry that happened to you. And your mom's mental health. And then you're feeling that you had to regulate the feelings of your mom and everybody else in order to keep the family in some kind of order. So that is a heavy burden. I was just talking in a video recently about over-functioning. If that hasn't come out by the time I publish this video, it's coming out any day now. Over-functioning is um, where you do more than your share. This thing, like a child who has to sit there and think about how to regulate everybody's feelings, that's exhausting, Madeline. That's like so much work. And kind of impossible to do. So whatever you were able to do, I applaud you. You did what you had to do to survive. I think this is a common thread. Limerence shows up in people who, um, a lot with alcoholic parents, where you have to manufacture safety, you have to manufacture hope, you have to manufacture love where there is no love. And I, well, I, I guess I'm not questioning, maybe your parents loved you, but I know how it is with alcoholism. I had parents like that too. And they, they, they may feel that deep down inside, but whatever is deep down inside is completely buried under the drama that's going on right now. It makes people very self-centered, right? So you go to this local bar and I'm like, well, if you're in my country and you're 20 and you go to local bars, you're underage and <laughs> you live in a small town. So everybody knows you and they shower you with attention because you're young and pretty. Okay. So you met a guy and, um, and you thought he would like your friend, but he likes you. So here's what I think is really significant about him. He's a musician. He's funny and intelligent. Um, he has a lot of knowledge about music and art, and you admire that about him. 
and he's caring, you later said. He has these qualities, and I think the, what, the, what first has been shown to you is he has qualities that you value, and they're good qualities. Like, I value those things too. I like people who have those qualities too. And I was just wondering, like, do you not have enough of those qualities in your own self? Do you, have, do you lack having enough people in your life who share those interests with you? Are you a little bit lonely to have people to appreciate those interests? Like, I have different people in my life and some of them are really, really great to go see an art film with and some of them are not. And some of them are really good to, you know, have a great deep philosophical conversation and some of them are not. And I've learned you do need different kinds of people. <clears throat> but I think limerence can show up when you have a history of neglect and a lack of things that are fun and exciting for you in the present. And life is like that sometimes. It's not very exciting. <laughs> And if you're, you know, if you're working in a young person's job and you're living in a small town, of course, somebody who's colorful and interesting, who comes along and takes an interest, of course, that's going to be captivating for you. Then you just notice that your interest in him went big. So if you hadn't had this thing that you told me that you've done this to a lot of friends, I would have said, I don't know. I think you're kind of in love with him. I think that's what's going on and you're not admitting it. But you, ha you told me you have a pattern of doing this with your friends where you adore them, you fit yourself to them, you want them to approve of you. And, um, oh, Madeline, that's just like little girl of an alcoholic stuff. I totally get it. I totally get it. And sometimes we just have to sort of burn through all these habits. They start to feel bad. And that's what causes us to change. So you're coming up upon a demand from yourself to like change to have a, ha a life that's actually happy not just happy and happy in this abstract way that you can imagine in your mind but you can't actually really have i thought it was also interesting that you feel this thing for him but he's older well older 10 years older is not necessarily a problem um, but he doesn't have his life together so if he's 30 and drinks too much and doesn't have his life together aha yeah not an ideal mate not yet perhaps he'll get it together later but nobody should date somebody betting on that. I know you're not even thinking of dating him, but I was just sort of like assessing who is this guy and you don't feel jealous. I don't know. There's, there's something about this story where something feels hidden or suppressed. Just going to say it. People in the comments may have some observation. Beware if they say he's a narcissist. I'm not hearing that he's done anything wrong. He has been friendly. He helped you get a job. He got a girlfriend and moved somewhere else. Nothing's wrong here. It's just that your feelings about him are very complicated. Oh yeah, fun to be around. And okay, so you can't figure it out. You feel good about your relationship. You want it to work. So, all right, this is what I'm going to suggest to you, Madeline. I, I just think you need to broaden your horizons and have more fun. You don't have to change anything about your relationship. You don't have to pursue this guy. He's in a relationship right now. And I think that... Um, your feelings for him could actually be very alarming for his girlfriend now. <laughs> Even though your intentions aren't there, the way that you kind of adore him, if she detects that, that would be really uncomfortable for her. So, so good. That's just sort of been taken off the field right now because that also the way you feel about him could really be unhealthy for your primary relationship, the relationship that you have right now with your boyfriend. And if you like that relationship, it's really good not to have people who are you know, kind of infiltrating your excitement, your romantic energy being something that you might feel like you have to have um, hidden about yourself. So that's not ideal. But I think you do need fun. You need more time. This You need more time enjoying art and music and being caring and having that exposure to those things in your life that are hard to get in a small town. You have to travel. So can you get to the nearest big city sometimes to go check out some culture? Like, I think that was what the draw was. And I think you can. Um, and I really encourage you to do that. Limerence can't take hold when you're happy. It just doesn't, it just tends to kind of roll off your back when you're happy and fulfilled. A hallmark sign of relationships that are affected by your past trauma is confusion around the feeling of jealousy. You're dating someone, you're in love with them, but there's something they're doing that just keeps like telling you that you're not safe, they can't be trusted. There's something going on behind your back and maybe you're about to get abandoned. And the confusion is, am I just being overly jealous and acting crazy? 
Or is my jealousy the right feeling, but I'm too crazy to leave this person who's making me feel this way? And since a lot of us are very good at making both mistakes, it's so important to ask for help. And that's what someone I'll call Gretchen is doing in the letter that she sent me the other day. And she says, Hey Anna, I need your help. I'm torn. I have CPTSD and before watching your videos, I never thought that I may be gaslighting myself by blaming everything on my OCD and anxiety. So OCD, you may know, obsessive compulsive disorder. But now I know that we do stay in bad relationships and others are actually wrong sometimes. I'm stuck here, not able to understand whether my OCD is pushing me to get out of a good relationship or my CPTSD is forcing me to stay in a bad one. Got the fairy pencil. I'm going to circle a few things that I want to come back to, but I'll read all the way through so you can hear Gretchen's letter and then we'll address the things I circled. All right. I entered this relationship one year ago and there was a lot of back and forth. And by that, I think she means that they broke up and got back together a lot, which is, you know, a recipe for trauma bonding. So I had always been honest with him about my mental health problems. So all the problems initially were blamed on my anxiety interestingly, by both of us. So they were both blaming her for, for the relationship problem, saying it was because of her anxiety or OCD. Okay. It took me a few months and a few of your videos to realize that I have formed poor boundaries, that I have apologized for saying things that, that felt important to me and giving a yes to all his demands. And that was not healthy. I tried to improve, but as soon as I put up a boundary, there was a huge, sad, angry, stonewalling, social media blocking, patching up again situation. Okay. Anna, is it right to ask him to limit his friendship with a girl who used to like him some time back and that their friendship has incidents that have made me feel insecure? Hmm. At the beginning of our relationship, he told me she is his best friend and that she liked him some time back. I was okay with it. Next, I found out she used to do his schoolwork for him, but that was before we got together. So I said, well, that was okay, but don't do it from now on. And yes, he never asked her to do that again. After a year together, there were incidents when his friends teased about her in front of me. They don't hang out alone, but I can sense that they are close. She sometimes used to come up in our conversations. Since I'm bad at expressing my needs, I often try to tell him my insecurities in a kind of code. Like I told him that I feel bad when she brags on social media that he's her best friend. And the interesting thing is, I never get a proper answer, not more than hmm or sad face emoji. Last week on her birthday, he posted a picture on a WhatsApp story of the two of them sitting too close together. I felt so hurt and got really angry. I asked if, when you knew I would feel bad, why did you post that? And he was like, she posted a picture of us together on my birthday, so I did it too, tit for tat. He also said that he knew I would feel so bad he was thinking of hiding the, the story from me, but he just didn't do it. After that, he told me to put it aside and talk about something else. After one week of feeling gaslighted and super anxious, I reached out again yesterday to him and boldly said that I don't want them to hang out at parties and I want them to communicate less, maybe only for work. We debated for two hours and he was stubborn on giving her a party on his birthday as she gave it to him on her last year's birthday. That's interesting. They give each other a party when it's their birthday. Okay. Throughout, he told me about how good a person she is. I think about this all the time. I've been in really bad mental health ever since this happened. I fear similar things can happen in the future because he never assured me or even acknowledged my feelings. I'm always anxious. I don't know why I am feeling that bad. Is it because OCD is making a small thing such a big thing or is CPTSD gaslighting me again? Maybe I'm wrong here and ready to accept it. It is impacting me that much. I can leave too, but that is super hard. I go back. We've tried that in our back and forth time. I could never hold back and thought of him not being in my life. So dreadful. No matter how much I make up my mind, I fear I would go back. My father is an alcoholic and I have seen my mother always fighting over his addiction and ending up apologizing to him and also convincing him to have dinner or breakfast or whatever. 
If it is really OCD and anxiety, I will work on it. But if it's not, I don't want to stay here. Please help me out. I'm 22 and he is 21 and we are in the same college and so is that girl. Sorry for writing so much. Thank you. Gretchen. Okay, Gretchen, I got you here. So I have a lot to say. The first thing I want to make sure you know is I'm not a therapist or a doctor, so I can't address whether OCD is at play here. I have a familiarity with CPTSD and, you know, until that formally is diagnosable in my country, I have a lot of freedom to just sort of say, yeah, it sounds like, sounds like you have it to me. I mean, once somebody has an alcoholic parent and there's a lot of fighting, it's pretty understandable if they have CPTSD or an attachment wound that makes it really hard to leave. But I did a little research on OCD because I wanted to understand, well, what would make somebody with OCD get really jealous? And there is a thing, and you probably know this, you didn't write me about it, but I don't know if this is what you have, but I'm, I'm, I, it sure rang a bell, according to your story, called retroactive jealousy. And it's a feature of some kinds of OCD where somebody is thinking all the time, about what their partner did in the past with a constant fear that they're gonna leave them and there would be a lot of like checking of their social media, maybe sneaking and looking at their texts or messages and things, and then getting a little bit of relief when they see nothing there, but then the anxiety just comes back again. So I read about that and I, I can't diagnose you, I don't know, but what you're describing sounds a lot like that. And I'll tell you why, why I think so. So you're 22 and he's 21, and I, I basically calibrate what I think is kind of healthy behavior for your ages. I think if you guys were 45 and you were married and you had a husband who had a best friend who was a woman and was always posting pictures about how close they are, then it would be a little bit of a different response, okay? But you're very young, you're in college, and his best friend is this woman, and he told you that going in, right? And you have not been able to let it go since then. And so the stuff you're telling me, like, I really don't have insight about him. You told me just a little bit about him. But what you've described in your relationship is that they're friends. On their birthdays, they throw parties for each other. They don't hang out alone. And he says she's a really good person. And what else about her? And then he posted pictures of, like, this is my best friend. And she posted pictures, too. You called it bragging. But I call it... I don't know, just really normal, just really normal. When you have a really good friend, it's totally normal and okay to put pictures up. Now I agree, if he has a girlfriend, like a very serious girlfriend, and you know, there comes a time in, a, in the evolution of the seriousness of a relationship that a person, a healthy person, is going to sort of preference the romantic relationship over the friendships. But a year into a relationship that's been on again, off again, really difficult, where he's getting a lot of pressure not to have the friendships he has, um, and that he's 21 and he's in college, I think that it's really normal and okay for him to have a really close friend and to have that override how it affects you. And I know that hurts. Um, I assume it's a sexual relationship and what's really natural in a sexual relationship is just feel like you want to be that person to them. You want to be cared for and, you know, number one, you want to be the top consideration and how you feel about it. But you're not. And, um, and I do think that's appropriate for the station of the relationship. So that's hard to take. One way to cope with that is to go a lot slower getting into relationships that maybe, I'm not going to be able to fully address whether this is OCD, but it does seem you have, you call it your needs, that he, um, that you're really bad at expressing your needs. But I just want to tell you, controlling other people's friendships is not one of your needs. You, your needs, I mean, strictly speaking, your needs are met well before you're in a relationship with a romantic partner. You meet your needs. And when you're sick or you're unable to care for, your, for yourself, then your family, to some degree society, your friends, they help meet your needs. You know, they might drive you to a hospital or come make sure you have something to eat. That would be helping to make, meet your needs. Now you get into a romantic relationship and I think what you're talking about is a need to never feel scared and jealous. Now nobody wants to feel scared and jealous. That's a drag. It's not fun to feel scared and jealous. Now, most of the time I'm responding to letters from people who are saying, you know, maybe I'm just being too jealous. And I'm like, I don't know, the guy is sleeping with other people and that would be cause for jealousy. And maybe you're not crazy. I don't think you're crazy. But 
we tell ourselves we're crazy sometimes. And a little bit, I think you're, you're trying to figure out, is this OCD or CPTSD? And it may be CPTSD is making it hard for you to leave when you're so unhappy. But I think if this guy's making you unhappy, you have a pretty high bar of feeling safe. And that might be hard to do in an early relationship when you're young is to say, you can't have female friends and you can't work. I don't want you to talk to them. I think it might be easier for you to see if I reverse the genders and just sort of say, if a man told a woman she's not allowed to talk to male friends and she, he wants her to reduce that, you might be able to sense how controlling to the point of emotional abuse that is. So first, I just want to encourage you. It's like, please allow him to be himself. What we do in a relationship is we get together with people as they are and we decide, you know, does that work for me? Do I feel happy in this relationship? Now, you definitely don't feel happy in this relationship, so I don't think it's working for you. If you're not able to leave as a result of your unhappiness, and that's what we do with CPTSD and with trauma wounds, and especially like what happened when you were growing up with the alcoholism, we do this thing where we're like, I don't feel loved. And I am miserable all the time, but I'm just going to keep trying to convince you that you should love me. And that would be true for a kid, like the parents should love the kid. But a romantic partner, is, it, there's no obligation there to come through and, you know, make your feelings how you want them to be. It's, it's abusive, actually, emotionally, to try to control people's relationships. And it's not in their best interest to stay with you. And because he just gives you the sad face and the, or the sad emoji and the hmm, when you say, I want you to stop talking to your best friend. I don't know, that's a sign of health to me. And the fact that he won't stop is a boundary that he's setting for you. And so I encourage you to look at that. A healthy-ish person is setting a boundary saying, look, I'm gonna have my friend. You're not able to leave. And I think that's really normal for somebody with CPTSD. And I think what's likely to happen is that he's going to end up leaving. That's probably what's going to happen. So you had said you're going to work on it. If I think, I don't know if it's OCD, but I do think that it's on you right now that you need to um, let go, let go, let him be who he is and decide for yourself if this relationship works for you. And as much as it does, you know, try to be loving and supportive of somebody. It's good to have best friends. I get that you're jealous. Um, this thing where she did his homework for him, I don't know. Um, that's a little unethical, but that's not, that's not really your business, right? Um, it might be a reason why you're not comfortable with him because it's unethical, but you know, he just gets to be him and you get to be you. He gets to be him. You get to be you. Love means you love who the person is. Dating is a time to get to know people and get to know yourself in a relationship and just sort of see like, is this somebody I could really go the distance with? Is this somebody that I could get even closer to? And I would say in this relationship, like the signs aren't there. You're totally uncomfortable with who he is. He's got a boundary. I encourage you to, you know, whatever has been working for you for the OCD, keep doing that. Keep doing that. It does, you know, just from what I read, it just sounds like, and what I read about OCD and when it, when it sort of activates this kind of jealousy that won't let go is that it's probably neurological. And if that's the case, wow, you know, at least, you know, it's like, you're not a bad person. You're not crazy, but there's some sort of like brain thing that's going on. That's making you read the situation in a way that's not commonly accepted by the culture. Now you might be in a slightly different culture than me. I don't know. I, I noticed that in your letter, I did edit your letter a little bit for clarity that sounded like maybe English isn't your first language. Um, so it might be a little different, but nonetheless, I still insist like to truly love somebody, you want them to have good friends, you trust them. So he has good friends, you don't trust him. And so it's impossible for you to feel safe with him. I don't think he's a bad guy. I just think it's not working for you and that I would really encourage you to work on that part of you that's getting jealous and wanting to control somebody rather than <laughs> to the, what, what none of us know how to do right out of the gate. It takes so much practice to slowly get involved with somebody and see if you're comfortable with them. Meanwhile, working on your own healing. And you did such a good job of just saying, you know, I don't know, you're just like all of us. I don't know if it's me just being too, you know, jealous or if it's me putting up with a bad relationship. He doesn't sound like a bad guy.